Good morning. God bless you all. It is so good to see you this morning. Would you like to have a seat? If you'd rather not, you can keep on standing. That's fine. <laughs> Welcome to the first worship experience for Awake Us Now. We believe that God is calling people everywhere to himself around the world. We believe we are living in the last days. We believe that our God has a plan and a purpose for this time and for each one of us. And this morning, as we come together, we're going to praise him and exalt his holy name. We're going to dig into his word and allow that word to speak powerfully to our lives and his Holy Spirit to encourage and guide and direct us. I'm Chris Dodge, Pastor Dodge. On behalf of our entire team, I welcome you this morning. I am just amazed at what God has done in less than three weeks' time. Uh, just absolutely amazing. We are going to spend some time here together in worship and in praise. And uh, as the, the worship team leads us, I would invite you to feel free to remain seated, to stand, whatever, uh, whatever you... We're going to sing for quite a while. And we're going to do that very deliberately. Because as we sing praises to God and as we come before his holy presence, as we worship him from the heart, he ministers to our hearts and our souls. And, and we desire this morning to truly be fresh clay in his hands, that he may mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus our Savior and use us in a powerful way. There are still plenty of seats here. If you look at this facility, this is something that, like within three weeks' time, just amazing, but there's room for about 900 people in here. And uh, we pray with God's blessings and guidance, we're going to fill this place up until we have to find other, other uh, settings. So... Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll turn it over and give praise to God, okay? Dear Father, how we praise your glorious name. It is such a joy to be among brothers and sisters in the faith, dear friends, new acquaintances, Lord. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be part of a ministry that is beginning very, very quickly, but a ministry where you have definitely guided and directed in such amazing ways in so short a period of time. Lord, may all the glory be yours this morning and in the days to come. May each of our hearts be open to receive all that you desire, and may we be your instruments and tools to reach others. Lord, our hearts grieve for a country that has wandered so far from you, and we long for our fellow countrymen, men and women and kids, to come to know you and to know the living Christ who transforms lives, who renews souls, who restores families, who rebuilds homes and lives and communities. Oh, Lord, as you are dwelling among us, may we be your presence in this community to draw others to you. Guide us now in worship, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship and praise him, shall we? That day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was asleep in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. His disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. The wind died down, and it was completely calm. Jesus said to his disciples, Why were you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? 
The disciples were terrified and asked one another, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father, we are in awe of you. You are the God of the universe. You control all things in your amazing power. And yet you are so near to your own. You speak to our hearts. You minister to our souls. You refresh us in the very innermost places with the good news of our Lord Jesus and with the fullness of your Holy Spirit. And you sustain us even in the storms of life. We thank you, Father, for your all-surpassing power, but we praise you for your all-surpassing goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you are gracious and merciful. We thank you that you are slow to anger, quick to forgive, abounding in steadfast love. And we praise you that it is your desire that every human being, every man and woman and child, the broken, the proud, the arrogant, and the humble, your desire is that each and every one of us be drawn to you and know you and experience the joy of life in your presence. Oh Lord, speak to us now through your word of truth. Minister to our hearts and draw us to Jesus in whom there is forgiveness and life and peace and purpose and a great plan. It's in his name we pray this. Amen. It is so good to see you this morning. God's blessings to every one of you. And a number of you have asked the question, so what is the plan here? <laughs> and the answer is real simple. God knows. We don't. <laughs> I'm not being flippant in saying that. What has happened has transpired very, very quickly. And what God has done, he has done very quickly. And we are simply trusting him to continue to lead and guide and direct. Our desire is that he be praised in everything. Our desire is that we be transformed more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our desire is that he uses each and every one of us to draw others to him. We are living in challenging times. We are living in an amazing time, but also a tragic time in our nation's history. And it is so essential that God's people live as God's people to call others back to him. And that is our prayer. And I believe the Lord has so much to teach us in these words from Mark chapter 4. Phil, thanks for sharing those with us. In fact, when we were talking just a few days ago about where we'd be going in this service, Phil immediately brightened up and he said, I know that scripture better, better than any other scripture. It's on my heart. And it has been on all of our hearts these last days. It was almost three weeks ago to the day 28th of October, that Jan and I and 41 others were on a, uh, a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee about 8 o'clock in the morning. It was calm, clear. The sun had come up over the eastern hills, and we found ourselves in a place that has changed little since Jesus' day. You know, today you go to Israel and you see a land where profound change has taken place very, very quickly. What was 150 years ago a desert wasteland is now blooming again. But what 20 years ago was a barren wilderness with a narrow little two-lane road following a path that pilgrims had followed for 3,000 years. That's now a superhighway, and the wilderness that just 20 years ago was one of the most barren places on earth is filled with settlements and high rises. God is doing an amazing thing. But there is one place that has changed little, and that is where this incident 
from Mark chapter 4 took place, the Sea of Galilee. The hills, the hills look pretty much the way they did in Jesus' day. There hasn't been a whole lot of development. Oh, there are a few McDonald's restaurants along the shore now, but you really can't see them unless you know where to look. But the hills look the same, and the sea is the same. And it was there that our Savior did some of the most amazing things. Three weeks ago, almost to the day, we were on that sea, celebrating the Lord's Supper, singing praise songs. But I'll tell you, my heart was broken. And on that sea, as I read these words to some dear friends and family, God spoke to me in ways that I definitely needed to hear. And I pray these words will speak to you in the same way. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35, that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. He has a plan. And he's going to take them places they have never been before. As Phil shared these words from Mark chapter 4 with us, he left unsaid what follows. Before the night is done, Jesus will have taken his disciples to places they had never been before. He will take them to a graveyard inhabited by demons, a horde of them, an army of them. He will take his good Jewish disciple friends to a pig farm. You better believe they've never been there before. And along the way, he will teach them and us things that are absolutely essential to our very life and our very souls. Let's go over to the other side, Jesus says. And so they hop into the boat. Evening is approaching. It's the best time on the Sea of Galilee. In Jesus' day, fishing was done at night. In fact, if you read in the Gospel of John, after Jesus' resurrection, we're told that his disciples were up on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and had put out their boats and had been fishing throughout the night. That's a great time to fish on the Sea of Galilee because, you see, the Sea of Galilee is a body of fresh water. It's the lowest body of fresh water on the face of the planet, 700 feet below sea level. It is surrounded by high hills. In the mornings, the sea is usually very calm. As afternoon approaches and as some of the, the hot breezes from the southwest come up over the hills or the cool breezes from Mount Hermon come down from the north or the breezes off the, the Mediterranean come in from the west, the sea becomes a little rougher. But by evening, it's calm again. And evening is the best time to be out there. Jesus says, let's go over to the other side, to the non-Jewish shore. And the disciples put out, and Jesus promptly falls to sleep. He's been teaching all day, and he crashes. We're told, in fact, that he was in the stern, sound asleep on the pillow. In fact, the Greek text is very, very plain and very clear. It says specifically, he was sleeping on the pillow. To this day, Arab fishermen throughout the Middle East, use large sacks of sand, sort of like the stuff you can pick up at Menards to put on your driveway, large 50, 70-pound sacks of sand. They use it for ballast in their boats. They call it ballast pillows. Jesus apparently was lying on such a sack of sand in the stern. Today on the Sea of Galilee, at Kibbutz Ginnasar, you can actually see a real fishing boat from Jesus' day. 25 years ago, a couple of brothers from the kibbutz were wandering along the shore looking for artifacts because the water was at the lowest level it had been in decades. 
And what they found was the remains of a fishing boat that goes back to the time of Jesus. Over the last 25 years, that boat has been preserved and restored. And today you can see it, 2,000 years old, a boat that may well have been floating out there on the Sea of Galilee with Jesus. It's not beyond the realm of the possible that he was even in that boat at one time. But as a result, we know quite a bit more about those boats. Small holding usually five or six people at the most, with a deck in the stern where the helmsman could stand, and underneath that deck, an area where the ballast would have been kept, where Jesus is sound asleep. The disciples head out on the sea. They're heading over to the other shore as Jesus had directed them. They're experienced, skilled sailors. They've been doing this all their lives. And suddenly, the worst thing imaginable blows up. A nighttime storm. Usually the night is calm. It's the best time to be out on the sea. But suddenly that storm comes up and threatens to swamp the boat. The disciples are absolutely terrified. These are individuals who know their job. They know their work. They know what is necessary to survive. They've been doing it since they were boys. And they realize we are in desperate straits right now. And there's a lesson for us there. You see this particular account from Mark chapter 4. It's also recorded by two other of the gospel writers. Matthew and Luke tell the same story. They don't give all the vivid details that Mark does, but they tell the story. What they say is, both of them, the storm came up suddenly. Have you ever noticed that about the storms of life? They often tend to come up rather suddenly and unexpectedly. And when those sudden storms hit your life, it is natural and all so human to be overwhelmed by what's taking place and to wonder, does anybody care? Does anybody know what's going on? What do I do in a situation like this? Maybe you've experienced such a storm in your own life. Perhaps you can think back over the years to one of those storms. Maybe you're going through the storm right now. It might be the storm that comes when you get the word from the doctor, the C word, cancer. And all of a sudden, your life or the life of someone so near and close to you is turned upside down in an instant. Perhaps it's the storm of betrayal when someone you have known and loved and trusted betrays you in a way that cuts to the very quick of your heart. And the storm It comes up so immediately. And you say, what am I going to do? Or maybe the storm in your life is the storm of an accident. One moment, everything is fine. And then it happens. Either to you or to someone you love. It might be a phone call saying, I'm at the hospital. It might be the sound of the squeal of brakes from the side of your car and then the resultant crash. But in an instant, everything can change. It might be that you lose your job. <laughs> Happens. <laughs> and in an instant, in an instant, Everything can change. And at that point, our reaction, your reaction, my reaction, is the same as the disciples. Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? You understand what I'm going through? Don't you care, Lord? As the waves break into the boat, as the storm threatens to overwhelm you, as life is turned upside down in an instant, the normal human reaction is, oh Lord, don't you care? And that is precisely what the disciples said. Teacher, 
Don't you care if we drown? Jesus is sound asleep. <laughs> they're the professionals. But their life is in turmoil. And there is only one place to go. And that's to him. And in despair and desperation, they cry out, don't you care? Have you ever been there in your life? Crying out to God, God, don't you care? Don't you care what I'm going through? Don't you care what's happening? Don't you care about your own? And the answer, of course, is he does. Absolutely he cares. And what we see here in Mark chapter 4 is not only nourishment for the soul, it is hope for the future. Jesus, we are told, got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And what Jesus is saying is, Folks, put into practice what I've declared to you all along. Watch what I will do. Because you see, it's not about the storm, and it's not about you or me. It's about the one who stills the storms. And it's about the one who has all surpassing power. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. He says to the wind and the waves, peace, silence, be still. And they are. And you know, that's even more frightening, isn't it? Because when you find yourself in the presence of the holy God, you understand how small you and I are and how great he is and what incredible things he desires to do. And what Jesus taught the disciples in the boat that day is transferable to your life and mine today. Because you see, first of all, he has power. He is the living God the disciples, they had read all their lives words from Psalm 107 that we spoke earlier today. Some of them went down to the sea in ships. The winds rose. The, sw the waves swelled. They cried out in despair. And then God intervened and said, Peace, be still. And the seas were calmed. The disciples had spoken those words from the time they were little kids. And now they saw it taking place before their very eyes. God's word coming alive for them. In the same way, what God desires to show you and me is his word coming alive in each of our lives so that he can accomplish far more than we could ever ask or imagine. We're living in a time of storms. We have an economic storm in our country, a health care storm. We have storms on the world stage. We have storms, crises of confidence. We have storms as public morality in our land crumbles before our very eyes. We have the storms of people whose relationships are crumbling, who long for meaning and purpose, but find little other than just a temporary fix. And what God is saying is, I am the one who answers the deepest and most desperate needs of your life. Turn to me. Jesus has that power. But more than power, he also has a plan. And that too is what we see here in Mark chapter 4. When Mark wrote these words, he did not put in chapter and verse numbers. Those were added about 1,200 years later. When Mark wrote these words, he simply told an ongoing story. And the story was that the same Jesus who has power over the wind and the waves is the Jesus who has power over demonic forces, power over 
the, the forces that can so easily destroy and the power to transform anyone, anyone, because he is good and he is God. And it is that that we hang on to because our God is a good and faithful God, a God who keeps his word. He is a God who ministers to his children in the deepest and most difficult times of their lives. And he is a God who speaks in power through his son and assures each and every one of us that as we turn to him, there is the assurance that he is in control and he will do mighty things. Many hundreds of years ago, God spoke through the prophet Nahum. This is what he said. Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Dear friends, that is most certainly true. The Lord is a refuge in your life and in mine. He is good. He cares for his own. And it is on that promise and that assurance on the very character of God that we can stand today and be strong and steadfast and certain even when everything around us may be upset and troubled. God is faithful and he will watch over his own. And it is in that confidence that we come together in worship here this morning Because you see, this is not something that we cooked up on our own. This is not something that was planned by us well in advance. This is something that was done in the spur of the moment. But God is never surprised by events. (laughs) You know, we have two occasions in the New Testament where we're told that Jesus was amazed by certain things. One is right here in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, where Jesus was amazed at the lack of faith in his own hometown, the people he had grown up with for decades. He was amazed at their lack of faith. In Luke, chapter 7, we're told that Jesus was amazed at the incredible faith of a centurion, a non-Jew. It blew him away. But you can search all through the scriptures and you will never find him being surprised. God is amazed, but he is never surprised. And the storms that may surprise us are well known to him. God does not say, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. (laughs) He never has and he never will. And he has a plan and a purpose, and he always has. And he has declared in his word what that plan is. The plan is that the nations will come before him in worship and praise. The plan is that people who are now estranged from him will come to know the living God and find meaning and purpose, not only for their lives today, but forever. And his plan is that his people not merely play church, but be the church. Especially in this day and age when so many have wandered so far from the plan of the Father. And so many are living lives that are emotionally bankrupt because they've never known the love of the Father. And they've never experienced the forgiveness that the Son desires to extend to all who call on him. And they have never known the peace that the Holy Spirit brings and the direction that he gives. You and I were created to experience that. You and I have been hardwired by the living God to live in a relationship with him. And we believe that he keeps his word and that he does these things. He always has, and he always will. And in the days to come, our desire is to continue to seek him, to seek his face, to search the scriptures, to allow the spirit of the living God to guide and direct us so that we not only worship and praise him, but that we are used by him 
to draw many others to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a different setting today. We're right in the heart of a community that has been here for many, many years. We are in a place where I know a number of you went to school. <laughs> and some of you even used to teach here. But we are also in the heart of the Twin Cities where God desires to do such incredible things calling people back to himself. His desire is to awaken people. Awaken people to the knowledge of what our God has done and what our God is doing and what our God can do. And his desire is to take each and every one of us and use us in such a way that our lives have purpose, not just for today, but for eternity. So that we will be able to look back and see how God has moved and God has worked. That's what we believe he desires to do. And that is what we resolve to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. What that is going to look like, I'll be real honest with you, I do not know. I don't know how all those pieces will come together. I do not know what the days ahead will bring. I do know this. God is faithful. He is never surprised. You can trust him in the storms, and he will take us to the other shore. I believe he is going to take us to places we've never been before, and that is good. I believe he is going to shake us in ways that we have never been shaken so that others may be drawn to him. I believe that his desire is to use us and use us powerfully. And I praise God that he has taken us through a storm and brought us to a new shore. I also believe he has great things in store for us and we will see what he will do. But this is what we know. He is a faithful God. He has always kept his word. He always ministers to his children in times of difficulty and trial. He can be depended upon. And he, he will bless his own. And he simply calls us, like those earliest disciples, to trust him. Jesus said, do you still have so little faith? He wasn't berating them. He was challenging them and saying, you put your confidence in me and watch what I will do. You've been fishing your own way for decades. Now you're going to fish my way and just watch what will happen. Read Mark chapter 5 this week. You'll find out what happened as he used them in incredible ways and demonstrated his mighty power. And it changed, it changed the entire side of the lake. Because what ultimately happened is that the Gentiles all through that region of the Decapolis came to a knowledge of the living God and of his son, Jesus Christ. And that is what our God desires to do in our day as well to draw people to himself. He takes us through the storm. He brings us through to the other shore. And he equips us to do what only he can do. And that, that's what his children have always needed to hear. And that's what his children who hear his voice always do. May God grant that in your life, in mine, and in our life together, let's allow God to do what he longs to do in each of us. And let's fill this place. Fill this place with people who have never known him before, but who are hungry for what only he can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we truly do come before you in awe. Awe at who you are, awe at what you have accomplished, awe at what you desire to do. Oh Lord our God, 
May our hearts be wholly dedicated to you. We pray that you would bless this ministry, Lord, but more than that, we pray that we would listen to you and hear your voice clearly and only do that which you call us to do. We pray, Father, for people throughout this community, in the blocks around this school, in the communities surrounding us, people who today do not yet know you, but people whom you have brought across our path or will bring across our paths. Oh, Lord, use us to bring them to you. May our behavior, our speech, our attitude, our facial expressions, everything about us give glory to you and bear witness to Jesus the Savior. Oh, Lord, use us to truly make a difference in this community, in this state, in our country. We pray it in the strong name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.